video, it's your boy Logos. And today when we at to Thomas, so I'll talk about the origins of woke culture. This is an interview or excerpts from an interview from 1995. So I'm curious to see what knowledge or wisdom he dropped from way back then that is still relevant today in 2023. Because his woke culture, in my opinion, has only exploded in the past 10 years. So I'm curious to see what he saw back in 1995 that is very relevant today, which is almost 30 years later. Let's get into it. The vision of the anointed. Now that's, a, that's an interesting title. Who are the anointed? They are the elite in the media, in, the, in politics. All of those who think that third parties ought to be making people's decisions for them. The subtitle is self-congratulation as a basis for social policy. In other words, people who think that everything that's wrong with the, econ the country is due to the fact that other people are just not as smart as they are. And if only they could, you know, or people like them could take over and make our decisions, we'd be so much better off. But in the early, in early America, didn't this sort of educated class make the decisions for everybody? W as far as governmental decisions, yeah. but the government itself didn't make uh, the decisions for everyone. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you know, you, you can't decide where your kid's going to school. You can't decide whether or not they can move a, a halfway house for drug, for drug users next door to you or whatnot. It's out but, of your control. The government that, decides that's that That's right. Stuff. The government decides too many things. They decide also how your children will be raised. Uh, you may have an idea about how, at what age children should be introduced to sex and in what manner, with what kind of moral commitment. You mean so as a parent? You as have a this parent, a parent, yes. Uh, the schools have taken that over. By the time you even think about it, they've already had years, you know, of showing. They're passing out condoms to these kids. Passing even out condoms you... is not not even the half of it. Uh, they're they're showing uh, motion pictures of naked couples engaging in sex, both homosexual and heterosexual, in the seventh grade. And if you, I wonder where that was from because I took sex education. Shoot, Rand was in the same class as me. We took sex education with the rest of our classmates, and they just showed us the diseases. They talked about body parts, but they definitely didn't show no sexual activities or anything crazy like that. That sounds like something that's going on today, not something that's going on in 1995. <laughs> so I don't know, but that shit is crazy. You complain about it, that's, that's considered to be censorship. You don't, you, you can't pull your kid out of school and say they don't have to put up with this stuff? I guess you could, no. but you'd be... Uh... Well, if you have a private school to put him in, but you have compulsory attendance laws, and if you don't have the money for private schools, then you're stuck. Where did yeah. this country get off the track and decide that the federal government should make most of our decisions? Well, it started to some extent in the New Deal, but I think the 1960s is sort of the golden age, if you want to put it that way, of this whole mindset. And that's what the book's about. It's about a mindset. It's not about a series of policies, but of showing how in policy after policy, those who think a certain way will uh, try to take over other people's decisions. How do you characterize the liberal philosophy today from the conservative philosophy? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess the main thing about the liberals, again, is that they think a program will do it. If there's something that they don't like in the society, you have set up a program and that will solve the problem. Uh, I think one of the things that, one of the words they use a lot is solutions. And I argue here and elsewhere that there are no, there are no solutions. There are just trade-offs. So, for example, when uh, Ralph Nader launched his attack against the Corps of Air many years ago, he said it's an unsafe car and it does the, has these safety problems and those safety problems. And in some respects, the, uh, he was correct, not all. Uh, but the fact is, there were other things that a Corps of Air would do that made it safer than other cars. Mm -hmm. uh, and on net balance, it was as safe as the rest of them. Are you saying there are no solutions to our problems as Americans? There are no solutions to anybody's problems. There are trade-offs. You know, um, safety... I think what he's saying is you can't have it all. Even if you have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of free time, you don't have a lot of freedom. If you're, you're poor, you may have a lot of free time, but you don't have a lot of money. So you just sit in there like nobody has it all. Nobody has a perfect life. An idea that the government could just go in, swoop in and figure it out and make everything perfect is unrealistic because not everybody's going to be a winner. For there to be winners, some people got to lose. And the best thing you can do is make yourself in the best situation possible for yourself. Here's a classic example. Uh, every, every, every year, so many hundreds of thousands of people are uh, vaccinated against uh, measles, smallpox, those kinds of things. Now, this saves several hundred lives that it's estimated. It also causes brain damage to about 30 kids a year. Now, there are no solutions in that. There are just trade-offs. What about crime? Take crime as an issue. Can we solve the crime issue? Or There's a tr I don't think so, because there's a trade-off with that. 
like I propose, I'm not for defunding police. I think we need more policing in black communities where there is high crime. But the trade off with that is there's going to be antagonizing situations sometimes because some person might get incorrectly identified. Some person might be lying. Sometimes you might get a crazy cop or overzealous cop. Sometimes you might get a corrupt cop. And sometimes the media will take those little instances or situations and blow them up to make it sound like that's the whole police force. And that leads to the whole program being shut down or the police pulling back and not going after crimes in minority communities like they should. Shoot, Thomas Sowell talks about that in his book, Black Rednecks and White Liberals. And you see that nonsense today when they want to defund the police. And it seems like many liberals think the police are evil or bad or something like that. It's a negative mindset in the black community too. No snitching, all that ignorance. I don't understand why you want to defend a criminal. They don't give a damn about you, but you want to give you want to give a fuck about them. It just sounds so stupid to me. Fundamentally solve it so it's reduced. Well, then that, that's just, that, that's 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 a, that's a trade off. You know, you know, you don't, you don't solve it. There will always be crime. There exactly. always has been, uh, but you want to keep it down to some level. It's not this astronomical thing we have today. Uh, for example, the people, the, the liberals right now are saying, you know, crime is eased off uh, in New York, and that's true. Uh, there, were, there were six times as much crime in New York a few years ago as there was in 1960. Now it's down to five times as much crime as there was in 1960. Now, that's not what I regard as a great, as a great, as a great trend, unless it continues a lot, a lot, a lot more sharply. The liberals think we need more education, and we need to help people in the inner city more to cut down crime there. Uh, Conservatives would say we have to be tougher on crime. Is either of them correct? Oh, I, 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 no, see, you see, the conservative view is really not a, not a solution. It's a, it's a trade-off. It says, yes, it would be wonderful if we could do all these things to prevent crime in the first place. We just don't happen to be that smart. And so what we do, we put people behind bars who commit violent crimes. Now, a few years ago in East Palo Alto, which is not far from Stanford University, a minority community, low income, they had the doubtful distinction of being the murder capital of the United States in proportion to their population. Uh, the next year, murder and all sorts of other violent crimes dropped tremendous amount, 30, 40, 50 percent in one year. Now, that wasn't because they discovered the root causes of crime or because they worked out everything that was wonderful. They launched a campaign that put a lot of the bad guys behind bars. And when they were behind bars, they didn't commit as many crimes. Uh, <laughs> that makes sense to me. Shocking. And the thing that, that, that Shocking. You put a criminal behind bars, you can't commit more crime. But somehow we still have ignorant people in our community talking about some free a criminal, free a rapper, free a murderer, free a robber. So stupid. It's, it's, it's marvelous. You know, even in a high crime area, the great majority of the people are not criminals. And so if you can just put your hands on those people who are raising all the, all the hell in the community and take them out of circulation, the crime rate drops. People say there's undue uh, emphasis on African Americans for committing crimes. Is that true? Uh, Ed Koch wrote an all column here that the population is 25% African American in New York. 62% of the crimes are committed by African Americans. Is that a? And he says I haven't I haven't checked his figures, but but yeah, throughout the world, this is this is this is not not unusual. Throughout the world, people are disproportionately represented in all kinds of different things. And it's true, obviously, in basketball. It's true in all kinds of other things. Uh, the main thing is not is not to keep people out of jail because they're one race or another, because when you do that, the people who are going to suffer the most will be the black community. Where are you on affirmative action? Against. Why? Well, you can only do one of two things. You can either just uh, judge people individually or you can judge them by groups. This whole notion that you're going to come out with a compromise, I would defy anybody to come out with a compromise on that. You're going to do one of those two things. Now, you can pretend to be doing other things, but that's all you're going to do. That's, those are the only two choices you really have in the end. Uh, again, the people who are the anointed think of this as a symbolic issue, and they want to be on the side of the angels. They don't ask, what are the consequences? <laughs> now, I've studied affirmative action programs around the world. One That's of the consequences the is that those people who are more fortunate in the group that has the preferences, those people take the lion's share of the preferences. Very often, those at the other end of the scale, the poorer people, uh, actually fall further behind. That's true of black share. It's true of Malays in Malaysia. It's true of various groups in India. And there are reasons for that. Uh, you know, you, you can say you must have certain proportion. Nothing is easier than for an employer who, would, who might otherwise locate, let's say, in the Bronx, to locate out in Provo, Utah, where he will be not near any black people, and therefore he will never have lawsuits, and the jobs will be in Provo, and people will wonder why don't people, you know, uh, here have more jobs. 
uh, it never seems to occur to, to liberals that other people are not blocks of wood, that when you set up certain incentives, they will react to them in certain ways. And when they do that, the result may be the opposite of what you set out to do. How do the anointed refer to people they don't agree with? All sorts of ways. But I think the main thing is they believe that uh, you're not merely in error but in sin. In other words, they can't believe that you're just mistaken. Uh, you, must have, uh, you must have sold out. You must have, uh, must be something warped about you. Mm -hmm. You guys are f by people like Thomas Sowell, like um, Officer Tatum, maybe even Young Whipper 59. You'll have some black people call them coons or other stupid stuff because they're not a Democrat or liberal. And it's how could you be a conservative or have some type of conservative values. But those same black people are the same ones that they don't like being stereotyped. They say they don't like it when white people get stereotyped. I'm sorry, they don't like when white people stereotype them, but they'll stereotype other black people when they step out of line, quote unquote, politically or socially. And it's freaking pathetic. And some of those same people nowadays, they think they're really smart and woke, but they really just the same type of people that they claim they hate or the same people they claim to be oppressed by. And it's pathetic. You can't call somebody a coon with no evidence besides the fact they have a different opinion than you. And then you think that you know what you're talking about just because you call someone a coon or a sellout or Uncle Tom or any of these other labels that people throw around these days. Same thing with racist, homophobic, transphobic. People just throw out labels nowadays to try to shut you up or because they can't. They can't come up with anything better to understand or counter what you're saying. So just throw a label and walk away feeling they're the champion. For the rich. Mm. You guys only care about the rich guys. Mm. Uh, answer that. How do, you, how do you respond? Liberal says conservatives only care about rich people. Well, one of the things I go into in the book is that the whole notion of rich is ridiculous. Uh, that most Americans don't stay in the same income bracket, even for one decade. So the same guy who is, quote, rich now was 20 years ago, probably in the bottom 20 percent. Exactly. I mean, I was on a cruise recently, a luxury cruise, and the guy said, you know, if so someone had told me when I was growing up that I would end up on a cruise like this, I would have said, get real, man. You know, that uh, very few people are in that same income bracket the whole time. Right. The genuinely rich and the genuinely poor, I would estimate to be no more than 3 percent of the American people. Really? Put together. Really? Yes. Genuinely poor. Now, they, I'm seeing numbers like when they were talking about health care, they said, uh, what, 30, 20, what, 30 million people couldn't afford it or something? That's uh, several million of those were making more than $50,000 a year. So it was not. See, this is one of the things the anointed do. They never believe that people make choices. There are people who, make, who have the money. They, they prefer to put that money into a BMW rather than have rather than A lot of young people didn't want health care. They, they were betting on their health. Uh, absolutely. And yeah. then this allows them to buy more stuff they want to buy. So it's not a question of they couldn't true. afford it. It's a question they don't choose to spend the money. It's accountability. That's the thing about the, the daddy government, the big brother, they want to try to control people's consequences. That's the thing with welfare, too. They want to save single mothers or save broken homes. When these people chose to make these babies and then they will sign up for benefits in Section 8 because they chose to open their legs over and over again. I'm not going to pay for your shit. I'm going to put your ass on the street. It's your fucking fault that you want to be a hoe and keep sleeping around to make all these babies. So you suffer consequences for them. It's not my job to take care of your ass. So that's not my concern. That's not my problem. When we keep allowing people to do stupid shit over and over again, they don't learn the consequences. And then we end up all paying for it. What about uh, mean-spirited? Conservatives are mean-spirited. They're, they're bigots. They don't like people. Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I tell people, people say, you know, you're, you're, you're a very uh, tough person. I, I'm not tough. Life is tough. I'm merely trying to acquaint you with, the, with those facts. You know, back in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson announced a war on poverty. Mm. Am I wrong? But there are more poor people. I mean, in other words, today than there were then. Yes. Yeah, there are more poor people. Yes. I mean, this was a hell of a war. We lost it, apparently, because for the last 30 years, we've been dumping money into these poverty programs. Oh, absolutely. Where's it, the money go? Oh, it, it, it supports a whole industry of people who uh, run those. Pro Shoot, 20, 30 years later, they're still running poverty programs and homelessness programs in California and probably other states, too. And for my I don't know, it's like two years ago now. But I remember watching a video with Ram where they were talking about they spent like tens of millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to fix poverty or homelessness in California, but nothing has been fixed in the past 10 years since doing so. And this stuff is ridiculous. 
And oftentimes, these politicians or people who run these programs, quote unquote, they'll line their own pockets with the money that's supposed to go to the homeless or the impoverished or the people who really need that stuff. It's, it's all like a vacuum for government corruption and BS to me. Programs who talk about those programs, research those programs, bureaucrats and so on. Doesn't help poor people. No. Uh, the tragedy you see is that the anointed really want to make symbolic statements. And running these programs makes those symbolic statements. They don't really care if in the, in the wake of affirmative action, for example, companies start locating away from minority communities so they don't even get involved in, in legal action. They don't care about that. They've made their statement on the side of the angels, and that's what's important. Have you ever debated Jesse Jackson? No, I haven't. Is that because, would you like to, or would he not want to do that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I've You'd seen be willing to, I assume. Oh, I, it, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you think that's too much showbiz? It is. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there are people who go out. Jesse Jackson is a joke. I do this, and I, I'm doing less and less of it. And I tell them the story of an, of an African uh, boxing champion who fought an Irishman in St. Patrick's Day, Day in Dublin. And he lost his title on what the sports writers called a questionable decision. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have to know what forum you're talking about. Right. I, was, I, was, I saw Shelby Steele on with him, and I said, you know, if Jesse Jackson and Shelby Steele each had to present a two-hour lecture to an audience with an average IQ of 120, Shelby would wipe him out. But if they had five seconds each on Donahue, it would be Jesse Jackson all the way. Right. So everything depends upon the forum. Uh, is Jesse Jackson good for African Americans or no, not? He's not. good for himself. No. Good for exactly. himself. Exactly. And that's himself. true of most ethnic leaders in most groups in most countries in most period of, periods of history. That what will make what will serve his interest is to keep people paranoid, dependent upon him, dependent upon government. What will serve mm -hmm. their interest is typically just the opposite. Exactly. Whew. That's pretty interesting. So you're saying and people still to this day, 30 years later, people still listen, following Jesse Jackson like a bunch of sheep. Saying that the, the leaders, whatever group, yeah. whatever, yeah. Leader, wants the people to be poor and dependent on them as opposed to dependent on themselves. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, you see this in the greatest cynicism in the academic world, where in many places, uh, black uh, organizations on campus have a say on who gets admitted. And they have turned down blacks with excellent credentials, both as students and as faculty members, uh, for that very reason. Who are the mascots of the anointed? You talk about the mascots of the anointed. They are people whom, whom they choose to um, back and whose rights are supposed to override other people's rights. The homeless are a classic example. Uh, well, even still now, you could say the homeless, but now it's like trans people, gay people, the alphabet people. Depend on the situation, the context, minorities, it depends. It just, you're supposed to override, override facts with logic. I mean, facts with feelings, and it makes no sense. And then you wonder why we have our culture and our society the way it is today. Uh, I'm, I'm appalled when I see people out there in the street uh, uh, giving money to, to the home. I'm mean, able bodied men. I yeah. think one of the classic pictures to me uh, was in San Francisco when there was this uh, able-bodied white man out in the street begging, and there's this black lady coming along there, uh, very modestly dressed like she didn't have, but she's stopping to open her purse to give him some money, you know. And I thought, good heavens, have we really come to this? And we've been brainwashed by the anointed into thinking, this is what we ought to do. What do you say to guys who bum money off of you? Not all of it can be repeated on, on, on the air, <laughs> but the fact is they don't get any money. They don't. And, I, and people who complain now about all these people begging in the street, there's a simple answer. Don't give them money, and they won't be in the street. When you wrote this, sure. what were you trying to accomplish with the book, and did you do it? Did, were you nailing liberals for 30 years of social policy? What were you trying to say? I was trying to reveal the thinking behind that, the kinds of assumptions, the kind of world that exists inside their mind, and therefore why those assumptions are so dangerous in the long run. It's not just the policies mentioned in, those, in that in that. They book. think they're better than everybody else. Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Uh, and that's what makes them dangerous. Uh, even all the policies that are mentioned there, 20 years from now, those policies may not be the policies we're concerned about. But that mindset will still be there. Mm -hmm. And what makes them tremendously dangerous is that facts that contradict what they believe are simply ignored or evaded. Just like I said, feelings over facts. And 30 years later, it's the same thing. It may be different policies, different social issues, maybe a few of the old ones still. But regardless, the same ideology, 
but it's with Marxism and socialism now, and it's ridiculous. Where does the press fall into this as the United Group? Are they part of the United? Oh, absolutely. They're a major part of it because one of mm -hmm. the reasons that people don't get many of the facts that go against what's believed is that the press doesn't choose to publicize those facts. And this was 30 years ago, man. If he would have had this interview go on yesterday, I would believe him. And this would sound the same and relevant. But this was like 30 some years ago, I think. <laughs> the man almost a prophet. But it's not for him being a prophet. The same nonsense was going back then, but it just ratcheted up to a different level. Now the media just openly biased. They openly don't tell the truth. And they're openly hot stories and cover for politicians and corporations that they care about. Or, let me take that back. They don't care about them. They pay them enough to care about getting that money constantly flowed in because nobody watches CNN, MSNBC anymore. Let's try the airport or you're over the age of 70. Give me an example of something the press might not cover or cover well. Oh, a few years, a few years ago, there was a story about um, prenatal care among blacks, that black women get less prenatal care than white women. The infant mortality rate is higher among the blacks. They immediately assume that one causes the other. Now, I, now I, one of the things I like to do is go back to the original source and find out what it said. I went back. On the very same page where it said that, it sh the, the figures showed Mexican-Americans get even less prenatal care than blacks, and they have a lower infant mortality rate than whites. So infant mortality Wow. I got sh to share that or see that study for myself so I can show it to some people. Because I see that bullshit all the time associated for the past five or ten years. How they talk about black women, they say the other not getting care and stuff. But they automatically attribute to racism because they can't think beyond racism. But prenatal care and infant mortality rate have nothing to do with each other. If you break it down further, uh, black women who have only a high school education, but who are married, their children have lower infant mortality rates than white women who have a college education who are unwed mothers. So it's not race, it's not income, it's not education, it's lifestyle. When you and people don't like to talk about their lifestyle because it's easier to say it's racism or you're a victim than to say that I got to do something myself to change my life. It's the, it's the government fault. Well, racist white people fault the reason why black children die, not because of our culture or our actions. <laughs> you live a certain way, there are consequences to that. The media doesn't want to, want, to, want to accept that. Because if you say people's lifestyles have a lot to do with the outcome, then there's no room for the anointed. Oh, man. See, that clip right there needs to go viral because that clip right there talks about that whole myth about prenatal care and black women and all that stuff we still hear hearing today. And that loves to go viral on social media without any sad statistical facts to go behind it. But it's crazy. 30 years in the past, Thomas Sal is still talking about relevant shit we got to hear about today in the future. It's ridiculous. It's your boy Logos, and I'll talk to y'all next time.